This is the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. I'm here today with Di Chilvers, and we are going to be discussing observing and documenting children's interests. So I'll just tell you a little bit about Di. So she's an independent advisory consultant in early childhood, and she's worked in early years for about 45 years. Um, So lots of experience from being a nursery nurse, a teacher, senior lecturer, advisor, and also a national strategies regional advisor, and many other roles and things that you do. So um, the DIES also created an assessment tool called the Development Map. Um, which she'll probably mention a little bit. Um, And also she's the creator of the Observation Toolkit, which really goes well with what we're discussing today. So thank you very much, Di, for being on the podcast. Thank you for asking me. (laughs) So we'll get cracking on straight away. So the first thing we're going to discuss is how do we choose what to observe? Right. It's a good question. It's a big question, but it's a good it's a good mm-hmm. question. It's a big question. Very I think loaded just, question. Yeah, yeah. Be, I, I think thank you for asking me to come and talk about my favorite subject for a start mm-hmm. off. Um and also just to say that um I think my interest and passion, if you like, about observing children began when I was about 16 when I started training as a nursery nurse on a NNEB. Uh, course at my Mm -hmm. uh, local FE college many many years ago I still have some of the observations and child studies that I did in those days and and they're very precious uh, because I think learning about um, how children develop and practicing observation and really understanding how children uh, learn uh, started when I was 16 and then has really grown and grown um, since I've uh, grown, basically. Um, so my work actually really starts from observation. So whenever I work with people and mm-hmm. I do that in, you know, with with uh, all sorts of uh, projects, uh, research things with nurseries and schools and settings and all sorts of things, we always start by observing the children. Mm-hmm. And whatever the subject is, whether it's about um, children's interests, about uh, language and communication, about play, about maths, because I've written a lot, quite a lot about mathematical development. Mm-hmm. Um, the starting point is always let's see what the children are doing. Let's observe what's going on. So I think, you know, that question about how do we choose what to observe is really a big one because. That, I think, really depends on how you view observation in practice. You know, um, for me, I know that when I observe children, I want to really go in there with quite an open mind. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to engage my observation toolkit. And by that, what I mean is it's in here. My observation Mm -hmm. toolkit is in here. It's everything I've learned or trained upon or been interested in. Um, finding out about children and how they develop, my knowledge of child development, my knowledge of things like the characteristics of effective learning, about how children develop language and um, and all those other aspects. Um, and you call upon that, you call upon those tools in your head that you develop and grow over a period of time to really look at children and what they're doing, their play, look at them as they're involved collaboratively um, and really think about, well, what am I seeing here? What's going on in front of me? Um, So, for example, the other day I'd got my my little, my neighbour's little girl around who's 10 months old Mm -hmm. and suddenly out popped this finger and the finger came out. And that, for me, is an amazing moment of development And I observed that and I actually wrote a little observation on that uh, called Frankie Finds Her Finger, which (laughs) because what that did was, was it noted in time that important moment of development when suddenly 
she's 10 months old and suddenly mm-hmm. she's able to direct your attention. Mm-hmm. She's able to be in charge and say, what's that? She's not verbally saying what's that, but her mm-hmm. finger is saying, what's that? Tell me about that. I like that. I'm interested in that. So that's what I'm doing when I'm observing children. I'm keeping an open mind. And, you know, observation is absolutely fundamental to our work. You know, we can't, whatever age we're teaching, and I would say this is the same for older children, but I'm thinking more about children from birth to six plus, that when we're working with them, whatever capacity that is, whatever we're doing with them, we should be observing because, and we should keep our eyes open and our ears open and our brains open to thinking, what is this child doing? Why are they doing that? How can I support them? So Mm -hmm. it's fundamental to working with young children. And and so for me, I don't see how we can possibly work with children and teach with children, teach children, um, unless we observe them. Uh, Mm Because, you know, that's how we understand who they are. We understand their relationships. We build our relationships through those observations. We listen to what they're saying and they're doing and they're thinking. And that's all done through observation. So that's why observation is at the centre of everything. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was very lucky to lead the working party on observation assessment in Birth to Five Matters. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, you you know, a lot of what I'm saying is in those pages from 38 to 2, I think it is. And there's a diagram on page 38, which really shows how we keep observation, assessment and planning right at the centre and how that helps us to understand children. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how, um, you know, I choose to observe like that. And when I'm working with people, I encourage them to work like that. We pull mm-hmm. upon lots of, of different perspectives. I think Mary Jane Drummond's work, and she's she's retired now, but what an amazing person she was in terms of observation and understanding children. She said this, she said, when we work with children, when we play and experiment and talk with them, when we watch them and everything they do, We're witnessing a fascinating and inspiring process. We're seeing children learn. Through our observations in everyday practice, we think about what we see, then we try and understand it, and then we need to put our understanding to good use. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, that for me is probably one of the best explanations of observation that there is. Mm -hmm. And, And certainly I think what I find fascinating is, is that, in New Zealand, where the early years practice is exemplary, I mean, it's probably some of the best practice in the world. And based on observation, they use a lot of learning stories and narrative observations of children. Mm-hmm. And they have based their principles of observation and documentation on that very quote from Mary Jane Drummond. So it's a key thing for me. And I think um, it really sums up what you were saying about observations <clears throat> and the fact that it really helps you put the child at the centre. And we always say, yeah. like, you know, the unique child needs to be at the centre of everything, what we do. Yes. You know, we need to have that child-centred approach. And I think when you described ob- observations, it sounds like if you go with that mindset of observing the child closely, then you really are helping to kind of helping yourself to see the child at the center it's almost like saying Mm. we need to be child-centered we need to have child-centered practice but how do we do that and I think the observations is the how yes it is it's how we how we unpick that and and of course the other the other thing is you know to be clear about choosing to observe or not in actual fact, it's a statutory duty to observe. Mm. And uh, and that includes people in reception classes, um, in schools, that um, the way that we assess children, our assessment um, is through observation. It's mm-hmm. through watching them and seeing what they're doing. Um, that So observe, assess, plan sort of process. And, you know, it's looking at, Well, what can I see the child doing? Can I see the child has made sense of that? Has the child understood that? Um, Is the child, you know, one of the best things I find is that if you observe children in continuous provision and in their play, 
in their child-led play particularly, um, you see just how much they understand. And also what you see is just how much whatever it is you've taught them, they've understood. Mm -hmm. Because that's where you'll see them doing it in action. You'll see them if they've understood how to, I don't know, balance a weighing scale or something, a balance scale, and you've shown them how to do it and so on. And then off they trot in their play and they're out in the big sand pit outside and suddenly you're seeing them with a whole load of other children saying, oh, yeah, come on, let's let's just check. Let's just weigh this out or whatever. And they're doing it and then they're using it in their play to to then build on other things mm -hmm. and other aspects of their play. So, um, you know, so it's a sign when you observe mm -hmm. them. That's why it's important to observe them in continuous provision, because they've not got any adult support there. They've not got any adult help. So what you're seeing happening in that observation truly reflects what they know and can do, and importantly, what they understand. So that's why observation is really important. And, and I worry a bit because I think, and, and schools are under such a lot of pressure, reception classes are under such a lot of pressure, that... Um, they use um, uh, sort of activities. They're always using activities, mm -hmm. pre-prepared activities. They, the um, the baseline assessment is a, a culprit of this, mm -hmm. where you've got these pre-prepared activities and you're giving them to the children and you're not really saying anything, you're just seeing if they can do it. It's almost like a test. Yeah. It is a test. And, you know, yes, they can do it. No, they can't. Well, actually, mm -hmm. that's not a true representation of whether the child can do that because it's it's under a diff it's under a completely weird circumstance mm -hmm. of an activity yeah. that's not connected to anything else mm -hmm. um, it's not in context it's not in context mm -hmm. so you then if they're out in their play and you give them that opportunity for continuous provision that's the place to observe because then you'll really know that they've actually got it not when they sat next to you with some mm -hmm. plastic bears or a um, an activity to check if they know their colours or their shapes or their numbers. Do it in, set it up in a child-led activity, a child, some experience um, in context, and then observe, watch. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't watch, if you don't observe, you'll miss it. So that's another issue because when, when to choose to observe, mm -hmm. if you're not observing children in their child-led play and in, in continuous provision, because you're too busy doing an activity over here that's far more important mm -hmm. or whatever, um, you're not actually seeing if those children really know what you've taught them or what, or, or you're not really seeing them um, developing their thinking, their talk, their language, their collaboration with others and so on, because you're not there looking. And that's the problem. Observation needs to be um, in child-led play. You need to go and observe what's happening in continuous provision to really get a good fix on what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's just um, not as e is that those pressures that we mentioned, isn't it? In terms of the baseline assessment and the early learning goals, when those yeah. outcomes are involved, when we're we have to kind of almost tick off and test for those specific outcomes. Then we have got those things in our head that we're looking for. And if we don't set them up, we're not necessarily going to see if the child can do something yeah. or not straight away, yeah. you know, or, yeah. and then we think, oh, we've still not seen them do this. We we need to try and set something yes. up. So it's just, it's a longer yeah. process, isn't it? And yeah. I guess, it is. And I, I think you're right there because what happens is you then start going chasing yeah. Um, objectives what you want or to chasing see. statements and you know you're right because then all you do is you keep you, you then got your blinkers on mm -hmm. because then you'll say oh god I must observe them doing some maths mm -hmm. and then you go off and you think that's all you're going to see and you might see some maths but actually you might see lots of other so much more well yeah. so much more and if you've only gone ahead and thought, right, well, I must observe these two things or three things that that was the problem with tick lists I mean, tick lists absolutely were murdered good observation mm -hmm. because all you did was go around with your iPad and look for your blooming statements yeah. um, to tick off. So you weren't even observing the brilliant things that children were doing um, because you were mm -hmm. too busy going around with your iPad. So, um, yeah, so I think I think it, it's a really good um, it's a really good question 
And I think it's one that perhaps people really need to think about uh, with their teams, with their with their strategic leads, you know, the, with, with whoever is the assessment coordinator or whoever's in mm-hmm. charge of, you know, um, uh, uh, early years or key stage one or whoever it is, managers, leaders. Um, there needs to be that clear discussion and understanding about, well, what are we choosing to observe and why? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there is, and I guess that question comes from the fact that there is so much to observe that you can observe. You can constantly be observing a child throughout the whole day. You know, you would come away with so, such a rich understanding and so many rich observations, yeah. but it's yeah. thinking I've got perhaps 30 children in the class or, or 16 or whatever it is, <clears throat> and I've got to observe every single one of them plus yeah. not only just observe them to understand them as mm. a, a person you know as an individual and plan for their interest but also to tick off these statements so then mm. it's that thinking mm. of when when do I observe what do I observe what do I choose almost like what's yeah. more important and I think that's yes. what the outcomes lead so you know we have to observe certain things and we have to tick certain boxes so we focus on observing the outcomes because yeah actually yeah. they are necessary they are statutory like the early learning mm. goals so that yeah. is what we choose to observe rather than yeah the, the I, think, I think play. yes yeah and I think the other thing that perhaps we don't recognize enough and I'm fascinated with, with this and we we talked about it a lot in the um, birth to five matters stuff we talked about observation in action yeah. And it was really, so if you go on to page 38 and you look at that diagram, you'll see um, where we talk about observation in action. Mm-hmm. Um, because what, what, what we forget is, is that, and I think we forget it because we're doing it almost intuitively and automatically, is that as we work with children, whatever age, we are automatically observing. Mm-hmm. You know, when we're yeah. when we're playing a game with them, when we're perhaps reading a story or mm-hmm. we're outside and we're doing doing activity, whatever it is, or engaged in some play in the home corner, we're constantly on that sort of like in our in our heads. And I mean, a lot of us are doing it mm-hmm. without even knowing. Yeah. It's intuitive that we've observed in action. So, for example, mm-hmm. we might be in the home corner making some tea or whatever it is with a child who's decided mm. to go to a tea party or whatever. And we're watching and we're observing and there might be multiple children in there. So we're not just observing one child at a time, we're observing them together. Mm-hmm. And that's important in itself because, you know, I think people think observations just have to happen with one child at a time. Well, no, we need to see the children yeah, together. Yeah. So, so if and then and then if you're in there and a child is sort of saying, oh, you know, well, I think we'll have um, we'll have pizza, I think, and um, you know, we go, we're all going to have pizza and it's going to have jelly on the top and blah blah. blah. <laughs> and then you might be thinking, well, okay, that's really interesting. So you've observed it and almost without a doubt and intuitively, you've probably bounced something back that said, oh, jelly, Ooh, that's interesting. What? Why do you? Why are you putting jelly on your pizza then? Um, and you've just what you've done there is you've observed in action. Within about seconds, you've then assessed the situation and thought, "Oh, right, here's an opportunity to ask a, a question." Mm-hmm. And then you planned it like within seconds, and out pops this question: "Oh, that's that's interesting. Why why have you decided on jelly?" And then that opens up a whole new discussion, Mm -hmm. dialogue, you know, interactions, you know, imaginative language, all sorts of things. Um, And you've just done that in the moment. You've not. Mm -hmm. So so I think people need to perhaps just take a step, step back and think about observation is not this. I think they have people have a very sort of stereotype view of observation Mm -hmm. as being something that you've always got paper. Yeah, pen, paper. Something really oh, like long. an iPad, like you say. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think that's that's really true to say. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I think guess... my thoughts there would be to look at birth to five matters mm. on that. Mm-hmm. So I was going to say, in terms of, you know, if we're always observing children, we're just not kind of always recognizing that we are. It just comes naturally as practitioners. Then what do we choose to record? Because we do need to record 
the mm. rich observations of children's interests you know so then yeah. we don't forget and we can plan for them and we can come back to yeah. that and reflect on it it's not just the outcomes that we need to record but then that brings up so much workload you know and paperwork yeah. etc and there's that yeah. issue of what well, what what do we yeah. use not only to observe but what do we choose to record as well to, yes. to minimize yes, that geez. workload so we're not taken away from the children yes yeah and again I, I think that's about changing your mindset on observation um you know if you see observation as important then um you're going to uh, perhaps look at ways that you can weave it into things a bit more rather than it just being seen as well I've got to observe um, and then I've got to assess and then I've got to plan. And so I'm going to do that with some big, I don't know, app-based document that mm-hmm. lets me tick it off or tag it or whatever, mm-hmm. um, rather than perhaps thinking, well, first of all, you don't need to observe everything for a start off because some of it you can keep in your head, but not all of it. There are going to be those specific, really important moments, like you've said, where you want to observe something uh, or, or something's just happened. You know, basically you see something because a lot of the time when uh, things happen, you haven't necessarily planned for that. And observations, yeah. you see this fabulous things happening with children, you know, in collaboration with each other, or maybe it's something that you're doing with them and, and um, you know, it's gone into this fabulous sort of discussion and dialogue mm-hmm. and children are running off and bringing things and so on. And in those situations, what you're really hoping is, is that there's a colleague nearby taking some photographs, mm-hmm. a colleague or a student you primed or, some, or a parent <laughs> even you primed to say, look, if you see this happening, will you just get the camera and take some photos? Mm-hmm. Um because those are the moments that you need to capture. Now, often those moments involve several children. So you've got an observation that covers several children. So if you go from thinking, oh, God, I've got to have 60 observations of these children every term because I've got 60 children in the group and blah, 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 mm-hmm. then you are going to be absolutely mind blown with that. Yeah. But if you then think, well, actually, I know that I've got all these these sort of collaborative observations, these what we might call learning stories, narratives that have shown something, an interest maybe unfolding. And I've got all those images and I've added a little bit of narrative with that. Um, I can then analyse that and think about, well, what, what did that child get out of that? How could I see what that child mm-hmm. was learning? Um, you know, what, what were they doing? Um, And then you can find out a lot more about children, particularly if you have gone in with that open mind. Mm -hmm. So rather than thinking, right, I'm going to do an observation on whether the children know, um, I don't know, their their numbers up to to five or whatever, um, you keep an open mind and you perhaps have set something out outside and you're looking for Mm -hmm. something. Maybe you've read a story or something's gone on. And you can see through your observation whether you've recorded it or not. But if you see it and it's really like, wow, that's an important thing, grab the camera. Mm -hmm. Um, You can then see not only whether the child's understood the maths, but you'll see lots of other things as well. You'll see all the characteristics of effective learning. So you'll see how, you know, they're being involved, they're concentrating, Mm -hmm. they're persisting, they're asking their own questions, they're following their own ideas. They're playing and exploring, but then you'll also see, I hear the language. You'll hear, oh, my word, he's just had that really big conversation with the, the, the friends. And they've said, mm-hmm. no, that, this is how we do it. Look, I think we should go and do this. Or, no, can you fetch that and do that? And and they've, they've co-constructed this together. Mm-hmm. And you've just witnessed some sustained shared thinking going on. So yeah. you want to capture that in your observation. And then so so in terms of workload, if you're if you're canny and you're working in a very sort of smart way, mm-hmm. you can use these sort of observations to then feed back to the children. And this is what I do with people. We we write learning stories and then we feed the story back to the children. We read it as a story mm-hmm. and we talk about it and say, oh, well, what, what were you doing here? Why did you why did you do that? Or 
what made you think that? So what you're doing then is you're reading the observation back Mm -hmm. group um, or individually, and you're asking them to think about their thinking and you're asking Mm -hmm. them to talk about their thinking now that's, that's really important because that's an important medical. skill. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's reflection. <laughs> that's getting to deepen that thinking. Mm-hmm. So that observation has suddenly become much more. And then it becomes even more when you send it home to the parents and mm-hmm. say, hey, look what your child has been doing. So that's where photos really help, don't they, in terms of sparking the child's uh, I guess memory of what they were doing and interest and and them seeing themselves so they feel like they can really obviously relate because it's them on the page on the photo and also yeah. sparking the conversations with yes. families as well um but really listening to the child's voice as well and having their yes. um input their their views and their say on this is exactly what I was doing and this is what I was thinking in this moment yes. and this is why rather than yes. our adult assumptions of what we have observed from the sideline I guess yes exactly I mean if I can just take liberty of just reading mm-hmm. one too so here is a lovely that is a one page yeah. little learning story and that is and there's from... not much wording on there it's not like a great no. big long narrative observation no no and this is part of some work I've been doing with South Acton uh, Nursery School and Children's Centre in West London on mm-hmm. documenting children's observations, particularly their interests, through this um, uh, observation in action thing. And mm-hmm. this was something that came out of it. And it's just one photograph. And it's an interest they've got in um, fruit and veg, actually. And there's a story behind that, which... Mm-hmm. I won't have time to tell you now, but um, the title of the story, this observation is The Interest Snowballs Through a Shared Discussion. And we, we, we the snowball thing is like a, a word we use a lot at South Acton because mm-hmm. what we, we find we're using it all the time. Oh, that really snowballed or, yeah, I observed that and you could see yeah. how that was snowballing and so on. Or, you know, we did this next and it just went viral. It snowballed. Mm-hmm. So this is what. Um, Siobhan wrote about this lovely discussion. She got the children together. It was an adult-led activity, but somebody mm-hmm. was taking photographs and listening to this at the same time, which was a help. Uh, but she got about six or seven children, and she said, we talked together after picking the fruit and vegetables. Olivia finds a hole in a tomato, and the children excitedly gather around to investigate. Siobhan asks, Siobhan's the adult, I wonder why there's a hole. And the children think maybe it was an ant. It could actually be a spider. I think the spider ate it because it was juicy. Siobhan suggests they use an endoscope camera to look into the hole. And to everyone's surprise, they find a slug fast asleep inside after finding its way into the tomato. (laughs) Now, that little observation speaks volumes Mm -hmm. of what... Um, you know, the children were saying the lovely conversation on the the and way all the she, learning opportunities that are coming yeah. out of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And that would go, that little my gallery observation would then go to every child's page that was on here, mm-hmm. and it would spark the next bit of learning, the next bit of um, and it and in that sense, the observation is informing the planning, it's informing the curriculum the children's interests that they've observed are now forming the curriculum. So you can Mm -hmm. see how now the observation isn't just an observation. It's become much more than that. It's become become part of the planning. It's part of the curriculum. The children are involved in that. We're sharing it. It's captured that moment and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's how you minimise the workload. You work more smartly Mm -hmm. and you stop ticking this. I love that. Yeah, work smarter, not harder. Yes, <laughs> a common yeah. saying, isn't it? And more enjoyably as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so you mentioned um, in children's interest in forming the curriculum. I know this is going a little bit kind of on the tangent, but um, so that means that our curriculum really needs to be quite fluid. Then, and we shouldn't think yeah. this is what we've set up for our setting as a curriculum every year or for this particular cohort at the start of the year perhaps or academic year actually it needs to be really flexible and fluid and going with the children's interests so you you're not focusing on you know this is what we're doing this term and this month and this week 
Yeah, absolutely. And there's got to be a real balance here. And that's where your observations really help you because, mm -hmm. you know, because you're really deeply observing children. And we're, we're talking here about really knowing the children well, because mm -hmm. you observe them a lot. You know exactly where they are in terms of their development, because you mm -hmm. really know, you know, what they're doing mm -hmm. because you've observed them. And um, and so then what happens is it's sort of like a spiral, really. The what the children are doing um, it informs how you're going, what you're going to do next to support them. So that informs the planning, it informs the curriculum, because you'll be covering all aspects of learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I know Ofsted only think the curriculum is like the seven areas of learning. <laughs> the curriculum is more than the seven areas of learning. So it's much more, yeah. Um, it's the characteristics of effective learning as well. So, so what happens is, is that um, I think one of the best ways to describe this is through the way that South Acton have been using these whiteboards. Mm -hmm. What they call, what they started off by calling planning boards, and okay. it's a great big whiteboard that you you know you can write on. They now call it their learning in action board um, and this is part of a, a, a piece I wrote for Nursery World with Siobhan the, mm -hmm. the, the person who wrote this lovely um, learning story uh, she is the she's now a teacher there I first mm -hmm. met her seven years eight years ago when she was a level two and she's now a teacher oh, wow. wow what a wonderful person she is with children she really knows the children well she's a great observer she understands mm -hmm. child development and how children learn and so on and um, and so she's taken the lead on these boards. And what happens is, is that they they they, they, they were called planning boards, uh, but now they're called learning in action boards because mm -hmm. it's about that going back to that observation in action that I talked about earlier that mm -hmm. we talk about Bertified Matters. Because what was happening was there were huge nursery schools. They've got a really big, you know, lots of children and, and quite a big team. Mm -hmm. And so they would be um, all this um, observation in action. So they'd be with the children and things would be happening. And they would try and remember a lot of those. But you can't remember everything. Yeah. So we started by using a big whiteboard that jotted down every time you saw something outside or inside, something memorable, something that a child had said, something that you thought, oh, that we need to follow that up. And you just whack it on the um, whiteboard. So that's what they started off by doing. So it was like recording those moments, those mm -hmm. observations in action that were really made you think, oh, no, I've got to, I must jot that down. That child's just mm -hmm. done that or that group of children have done this. And then they did that for a long time and they developed it. But then what started to happen was they realised they, they were tuning into children's interests and stuff and and the, the, the what the child-led play, basically, mm -hmm. the, child, the children were doing. And But then we started talking about those observations as being a bit superficial, that it was like, oh, um, Jodie's playing with the with the the the, the trundle bike again, um, mm -hmm. uh, enjoying balancing on the bike. Okay, I mean, actual fact, you could probably just keep that in your head. Actually, you don't necessarily mm, have to write it's it not down. Necessary to write it, yeah. So, so what happened was we started saying, well, wait a minute. You know, we've got all these things written down, but where does that take you? Those interests, mm -hmm. you know, he's got an interest in castles or he's got an interest in yeah. know, uh, whatever. Um, and we decided we've got to dig deeper on that because these mm -hmm. were, sort of, I mean, it was good, but it was a superficial look at interests. Yeah. So saying, oh, he's got an interest in cars. So let's give him more cars. Mm -hmm. No, they on. may have so many different interests. It's like, what do we define as a child's interest? What do we really yeah. hone in on and focus on? Yes, yes. And so we we started looking at Helen Hedger's work. And Helen Hedger's work is fab. She's based in New Zealand and she's done a lot of okay. work on interests, children's interests and observing interests. And she had a similar question, really, because what she was concerned about was that we were looking a lot at children's interests in a sort of superficial way, what she calls activity-based interests, you know, mm -hmm. that, that 
you know, oh, well, he likes cars, so I'll just give him a load of activities with cars. I'll just give him even more cars Mm -hmm. and stuff. And so she said that what we needed to do was to really um, look beyond that and to Mm -hmm. start thinking about, well, what's the deeper thing that's going on there? Let's look at what what what's deep because it might not just it might be it might be about the the way the wheels turn on the car i mean i've had this before in the past where you've you've observed a child with cars and basically you thought oh yeah he likes cars and then when you've dug deeper so for example we gave this little boy a camera and said oh you know go, and we went into the car park with him all supervised and uh, got him to take pictures of, of what he thought about the cars <laughs> And when we went in those days, we had to develop them. When we got the pictures developed, it was mm-hmm. amazing because what you'd taken pictures of were all the lamps and the lights and the number plates. Oh, I thought you were going to say is... wheels, but no. no. No, it wasn't. It was the number plates and the lights mm-hmm. and how those oh. worked. So we realised we needed to do much more. You know, there, there was something really deeper there, what what Helen Hedges calls um. Uh, an interest in in motion, I love that, where it's deeper and it's more, um, you know, we're going into depth. It's a working theory. She Mm -hmm. calls this these working theories, children's working theories and digging deeper. And so we followed her work. And so what Siobhan did on the board was to encourage the team to say, okay, let's write, if it's an initial interest you've observed, let's write that in black. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in green, we'll put who's involved in that, you know, who are the children, because then we can see who's clustered around that interest and who is involved in it, interested in the interest. Mm-hmm. And then we'll write in red how we're going to deepen that interest so that it becomes um, a much more, uh, it might become a continuous interest, which is what Helen Hedges mm-hmm. talks about, continuing interest. So it's not just a quick flash in the pan. And that's where everybody gets a bit like wappy and says, oh, how can I follow 40 children's interests? Well, yeah, you don't really. What you're doing is you're observing, observing to see where those interests are going. Mm-hmm. And often then on the board, you could see the connections between some of the interests. And also you could see that children were clustering around an mm-hmm. interest. So your observations told you that actually that's the interest that most of them are interested in. So let's continue with that, as Helen Hedges Mm -hmm. would say. And we'll have a continuing interest there and we'll develop it further as maybe a little bit of a project or something, Mm -hmm. a theme or something. Um, You know, we might then take them on a visit or we might go and do something else. But, But Helen Hedges talks about the importance of those really looking beyond those superficial interests mm-hmm. which are important but then observing observing and thinking about what's under that what's the deeper bit there and how can we extend it so mm-hmm. we use a lot of her work really and that's very much described in the nursery world article Siobhan and I wrote the other week mm-hmm. um which talked about all of that and, and really how important it was to go Observation in action, brilliant. We've recorded it. But what are we going to do with that? Mm-hmm. So the planning board, I'll, I'll just explain this and then, and then I'll yeah. stop. But but the planning, the, the white board, which is bigger, the biggest you can get, mm-hmm. actually then becomes the hub of everything. So the team gather around that at the end of the session, at the end of the day. They talk about, well, well, I saw him do this. And then I think that's part of this. And have you noticed how he's doing the same thing there and the same thing there? I think there might be a schema going on here. Mm-hmm. And it becomes very reflective. Mm-hmm. And the adults, you know, really get excited about yeah. seeing what's going on. And they learn such a lot about all the children, not just their own key children. Mm-hmm. And that board becomes the whole focus for planning. Mm-hmm. And and so, to, yeah. I was going to say it's important to have that shared reflection and something to really spark that because a lot of oh, the time yeah. that's the difficult part in settings in terms of having enough time and even energy yes. to you know sit down together but actually when you've got that visual mm. planning board mm. um, and it's all constantly um, being added to you know yes. like you say it's all in action 
Yes. Um, it really yeah. does support that shared reflection, yeah. doesn't it? Because you're constantly seeing it and it's there and yes. you, can, you yes. can pick up on things now and again. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, is that the parents are seeing it now as well. Mm-hmm. And the children are seeing it. I mean, there is yes. a bit of a dichotomy here because if you have the board low down, which mm. is where you'd like the children to see, because they stick pictures on it as well. Yeah. But then the children come along and it starts to like <laughs> So it's a bit higher up. Yeah. Um, the other thing to do is to always make sure you take a photograph of your board every time your board is full. You take a photograph of it and you keep that. And what they do at South Acton is they put it in a floor book. And mm. along with anything else that relates to that particular, could be a week, it could be a couple of weeks. It depends what's going on. Mm. And But then you can always go back to it and look yeah. back at it and say, do you know, I think we saw them doing that a few weeks ago. And then you flip back and you think, oh, yes, there it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it's a real sort of living, breathing thing mm-hmm. of observation in action assessment in action and planning in action Mm -hmm. and it's 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 inspiring and that is also something that helps to minimize that workload and and time spent away from the children as well isn't it because you know you jot things down you know things down that you've remembered you've taken photos you pop it on there and then you have that collaborative kind of reflection yes you take a photo and it's not necessarily about writing down kind of pages and pages of narrative observations no, and no not no. really and then having to read yeah. it back and reflect on it on your own and thinking I don't really know what I'm seeing here it's just a description of what the children did but yeah. actually it's so yes. much deeper than that when you have these little snippets in the moment yes it is mm-hmm. and 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 the board helps you to connect it all so that then when you go and you do um I mean they use the development map there as well so it works really nicely because then when they start to do the child's development map Mm-hmm. They've got the information that's in the head. They've got all that rich information on the whiteboards that they've kept. They've got these lovely little sort of short. They do long. They do longer learning stories as well. But these mm-hmm. lovely shorter learning stories. Uh, some are collaborative with lots of other children. Some are on individual children. But mm. then you've built up that picture. So when you do. Yeah think about their development map and where are they now right I need to just see where what what my observations are telling me about their development Mm -hmm. and then they use the development map to actually map that and it shows the child's development in a holistic way Mm -hmm. so it all links nicely together because you know what's underneath all this is is actually um how we understand children's development so the biggest thing is the more you observe the more you understand child development. And I think, you know, obviously you need to train really as well, or your CPD mm-hmm. and everything needs to revolve around child development. So if I don't understand what schemas are, I need to go and find out. Mm-hmm. If I need to find out about children's mathematical development, then maybe I need to read something about it and, and you know, build my toolkit. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what the observation toolkit's about. It's about helping practitioners and teachers and anybody who works with young children to have a better understanding of all those things like language development or Mm -hmm. sustained shared thinking or children's interests um, and how they can understand that. So when they observe, they know what they're looking at. Yeah. I think seeing it as a toolkit really helps it to feel almost less overwhelming because if you if you if you're an apprentice or maybe you have just come out of a level two or three training course and you think oh gosh I'm in a setting now and there's still so many of these things that I need to learn and actually I've never heard of schemas before I've not I don't know enough and then you kind of get a bit lost and with all these articles Mm. and and everything you know so maybe seeing it as a tool an observation toolkit you kind of think okay so to really observe a child well and that means that I can really put them at the center and I can do all this planning and and plan for their interest what what do I need to do what do I need to have in my toolkit in order to be able to do this and then breaking it down in that way that's exactly a bit more manageable that is exactly it Angelica it's about and I always say to people I was working with some people um who there were two young apprentices in there on Monday and uh, we were talking about child development. We we're talking about the development map and, well, what can you see here in terms of child development? And I just said to the two of them, I said, look, they're only about 19, 18 or 19. And I mm-hmm. said, look, don't worry. I said, I'm very old now. 
my toolkit is probably it's not full and there's lots more I can learn but mm-hmm. you're just starting so the best thing you can do is work with your colleagues here who are very knowledgeable and I always recommend buddying buddy mm-hmm. with with someone who's more knowledgeable than you about child development yeah. and talk about your observations and uh, but I said you've got to grow it you grow your toolkit mm-hmm. Um, and so you can't do it all at once. You know, it's one bit at a time. And but that's what makes so, it so interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that you're constantly learning. I think it's so important to, that you mentioned here talking about your observations. Again, I know we said, you know, that shared reflection, but having mm. a buddy that you can talk about the observations with. Yes. And I guess it's important for leaders to talk with their practitioners of their teams and and say what tell me about your observations what have you observed yes. tell me about this child because actually yeah. that is preparing them for that for those moments that are so pressured um around kind of performing and and showing your knowledge whether it's officer that comes in and asks whether yes. it's a parent that asks about Dead their child right. or someone else yeah. actually you need to be used to being able to talk about your children and what you've observed yes. so when you mentioned the fact that you know those observations are quite small um and that you know there's longer ones like you said but then the the things on the board are quite short snippets it's not about having like i said before lots of narrative observations mm. to then show offset or whoever yeah to, to showcase that this is what you're doing and this is what you understand it's being able to talk about it so you may have a yes. sentence and a photograph yeah. and to yeah. An outsider that doesn't really say anything, but actually, yeah. if you can talk about it and exactly use your toolkit to say this is exactly yeah. what the child is learning, these are the skills that they're showing. Yes, then that really is demonstrating all of your knowledge and yes. the child's learning that yeah. they are experiencing yeah. in your setting. Absolutely, I think you've summed that up really well. And I mean, imagine you know, offset is one thing, but you know, you're mm. talking to parents all the time. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think children, particularly children with special educational needs, when you're trying to talk to their parents and you show them involved in one of these mm. lovely little my gallery observations or a learning story, and then you can see the positives, you you know, that is so helpful. But yes, that's exactly it. So, I mean, observation, you know, we've come full circle, really. Mm. Observation is so much more than just thinking about, oh, I've got to observe because I've got to do some mm, assessment. So what, yeah. Yeah. What a nuisance. You think, no, not what a nuisance. What a privilege, mm, you know, yeah. because we're listening to children. I mean, this is why, I, you know, I think what you've done with the voice of early childhood is really important because we don't listen to children enough. Nowadays, we really don't. And our observations are key, a key part of listening to children. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I finish on this really, but just to tell people about in Reggio Emilia, they have this thing called the pedagogy of listening, mm-hmm. which you sort of think, well, what's all that about? And basically what they mean is the pedagogy of listening is about that a toolkit thing but it's about right i'm going to i'm going to listen to children through my watching mm-hmm. i'm going to listen to children by listening i'm going to listen to children by understanding their emotions understanding who they are their relationship um who their parents are i'm going to listen to children through their interests and their ideas mm-hmm. and what rocks their world and I'm going to listen to children in what they would call a hundred different ways, the hundred languages. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we don't just listen to children by writing it down all the time, although mm-hmm. that is so important in these stories. Um, but it's actually that is what observation does. Mm-hmm. That's about valuing and 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 recognizing and respecting the voice of the child. Yeah. And and I think that brings in the voice of the practitioner as well in terms of you know those shared reflections too so really um allowing everyone to have a voice here yes Um, and like you said it's a it's a great place to to sum all this up because that is the kind of mindset that we should be having and Mm. that's how we should be viewing observations it's listening to children rather than like you said it's a tick list yes exactly Yeah. yeah that's it in a nutshell (laughs) <laughs> well thank you very much Di it's been really brilliant talking to you and I'm sure I've enjoyed listeners, it um, yeah and I think the listeners will take lots of um, 
really interesting things from this and the kind of snippets that they can take back to their their work and their sessions even if they already do planning in in such a way through kind yeah, of whiteboards so. there's lots of little things that we can pick up on mm. um and yeah the listeners can find out more on the voice of early childhood website of course and i'm sure di will work together on some other podcast episodes soon yeah i'd love to thanks thanks angelica that's great i've enjoyed it thank you thank you very much <laughs>